Hello and welcome back to Harmonix Tuning. In today's episode, we are going to be working on the steel grey Skoda Kodiak with the 2 litre TSI engine and the DQ381 gearbox. As always, we have put the car on the lift. Now we are going to inspect the car for any mechanical issues and then we are going to load the car back onto the dyno for some baseline numbers. The major difference in the exhaust setups between the MK3 Octavia 1.8 TSI's and the 2.0 TSI engines that come in the VRS 230's and the 245's is, those cars do not have dual OPFs that you see over here in the exhaust tree. What you can also see here is the pre-OPF sensor and the post-OPF sensor. The sensors actually measure the amount of exhaust gases flowing through it pre and post the OPFs and then they communicate that data to the ECU. So one of the reasons why we do a mandatory physical check on the car is a lot of the times we've seen that these intercool hoses, the clamps are really, really loose. So let's check on this car and see how loose they are. So what happens is when the clamps on these intercooler hoses aren't tightened properly, you end up having a little bit of boost leak between the intercooler hoses and the intercooler. And that is how these cars don't make the rated power that they're supposed to. So the car doesn't seem to have any coolant leaks or oil leaks. However, the coolant level on the canister over here is a little less. So now we're going to start topping up the coolant to the max level. Now let's take the car off the lift and put it on the dyno. In case you guys are wondering how we are able to dyno test a four wheel drive car like the Skoda Kodiak Dragon Tig 1, that is because both these cars come with the DQ381 gearbox that is based on the Haldex platform. Any car that is based on the Haldex platform, we can disconnect the Haldex controller, making these cars completely front wheel drive, and then we can dyno these on a two wheel drive dyno. Now that we are done dynoing the car in completely bone stock form, Let's replace the OEM paper filter with this BMC OE replacement filter. We finished flashing a stage 1 ECU tune and a stage 2 gearbox tune. Now let's dyno the car again and see what numbers it makes post both the tunes. Now that we are done dyno testing the car, let's start data logging the car to see if everything is running as it should. Let us take a look at the dyno charts between the stock and the tuned Kodiak now. The stock car made 179 horsepower and 304 Nm and the tuned car made 210 horsepower and 350 Nm. That's a peak gain of 31 horsepower and 46 Nm of torque. Let's take a closer look at the horsepower curve and we can clearly see that the power starts to drop pretty drastically post 5400 RPM. This is because the stock turbos are really small on these engines and just cannot flow enough to make more top end power. When your engine is limited by the boost the turbo can run up top, the only way to make more power is to run higher ignition timing. However, that is easier said than done because the ignition timing is dictated by the quality or the RON value of the fuel. So higher the RON value of the fuel, the more ignition timing we can run to make more top end power. However, since we are running just 95 RON fuel on this car, we are severely limited by the octane rating of the fuel and thus cannot run any higher ignition timing, thereby causing the power to drop post 5400 RPM. Many of you have requested us to make a detailed video on what changes are made when we tune a car and in today's episode we thought that we will give you guys a brief introduction using data logs. What you guys are seeing on your screens right now is the data log of a stock Gen 3B engine. On the X axis is the time in seconds and on your Y axis are all the parameters that we have logged on the dyno that you see in the box on the left hand side. So the first parameter we are going to look at is the lambda set point versus the lambda actual. Majority of the modern turbocharged petrol engines run a lambda of 1 from the factory and as you go higher in the RPMs, the manufacturers can target a lower value as you can see in the screen in front of you. The next parameter we look at is the accelerator pedal position versus the throttle angle. 
The red curve here shows that even when we go 100% on the throttle, as goes with all modern day drive-by-wire setups, the ECU decides when it has to open the butterfly in the throttle body to the maximum possible position. In this data log, one can clearly notice that even though the accelerator pedal position was at 100%, the throttle position only reaches 79% at 4940 RPM. The next thing we look at is how the fuel quality in the car is, and for that we log knock correction on all the cylinders. On this car, the fuel doesn't look that bad. However, since in stock form, these engines run pretty aggressive ignition timing, the ECU is pulling about minus 3 degrees of ignition timing in the higher RPMs. Now that we know that the fuel quality is okay, we then proceed to see if the car has any boost leaks. And for that, we log the boost pressure set point versus the boost pressure actual. The boost pressure actual should actually follow the set point line and if it drastically stays below the set point line, then we know that there is a boost leak on the car that needs fixing. Then we look at the rail pressure in order to ensure that the fuel going to the engine is sufficient and there is no bottleneck there. The next thing we check on the car is to make sure that the spark plugs and the ignition coil packs are running fine and there are no misfires on the engine that can affect the performance. As you guys can see from the data log in front of you guys, this car has typically zero misfires. The last thing we check on these cars is the intake manifold temperature because this shows us how good the cooling system on the car is. In this particular car, while the ambient temperatures were about 35 degrees while we dyno the car, as you guys can see from the data log in front of you guys, the intake air temperatures reached nearly 82 degrees while we were doing the pulls. Now that you guys have seen what the data logs on the stock car look like, let's add the stage 1 data logs and see what the comparison between the stock tune and the stage 1 tune is. In the screen in front of you, we have basically aligned the engine RPMs of both the stock run and the stage 1 tune. Now let's look at the different parameters and see what's different between the stock tune and the stage 1 tune. The first thing we are going to be looking at between both the charts is the lambda set point. The stock car runs a lambda of 1 up until 4500 odd RPM and then it starts to drop down. However, you guys can notice that on our stage 1 tune, our lambda value set point is set to a lot lower than the stock tune. Now let us look at the throttle position difference between the stock car and the tune car. As you guys can see, the throttle position on the stock car starts getting to 79% only at about 4900 RPM. However, with our tune, we reach 100% throttle position much earlier as well. So what you guys are seeing on your screen right now is the knock correction on our stage 1 tune. Except one cylinder, all other cylinders have zero knock and one cylinder is pulling ignition timing to about minus 3 degrees. If you guys are wondering why our stage 1 tune runs less knock correction than the stock tune, that is because as we increase the boost, the stage 1 tune also decreases the ignition timing than the stock curve. As we mentioned earlier, now let's look at the spark advance, which is the ignition timing on basically the stock tune and the stage one tune. As you guys can see from the data logs in front of you, the stock tune runs a much more aggressive ignition timing, whereas the stage one tune runs slightly lesser ignition timing as we are running higher boost. Now let us look at the boost set point between the stock tune and the stage one tune. As you guys can see from the data log in front of you guys, our stage one tune commands a pretty significant increase in boost compared to the stock map. A lot of people assume that the 2.0 TSI engines that come in the Kodiak, the Tiguan, the Q2 and the new A4s are basically detuned versions of the Octavia VRS 230 and the 245 engines. However, that is not the case. All of the engines that are rated at 190 horsepower or 204 horsepower and 320 Nm from the factory basically come with the Volkswagen's Budak cycle of engines which are designated the engine code EA Gen 3B. These EA Gen 3B engines run a very high compression ratio of 11.7 is to 1 in comparison to the 230 and the 245 engines which run a compression ratio of about 9.6 is to 1. One of the easiest ways to identify the Gen 3B engines from the VRS engines is basically by looking at the engine itself. What you're looking at here is the camshaft actuators and on the Gen 3B engines these come on the front of the engine whereas on the VRS 230 and the 245 engines these camshaft actuators come on the back of the engine. The second difference you can make out is basically looking at the high pressure fuel pump over here. This high pressure fuel pump looks totally different to the VRS engines. And the biggest giveaway on how to identify a Gen 3B engine is looking at this MAF sensor that comes on the intake. Apart from the visual differences we've already shown you guys, the Gen 3B engines basically run a Continental Rax turbo that is over here, whereas the VRS engines run a IHI IS20 turbo. And the last visual difference to identify the VRS engines from the Gen 3B engines is by looking at the manufacturer of the ECU itself. While the Octavia VRS 230s and the 245s run a CMOS 18 ECU, the Gen 3B engines come with a Bosch MG1 ECU. 
So from the dyno charts, you guys can clearly see that the stock car made about 179 horsepower and 304 newton meters of torque, whereas with the tunes, the car made about 210 horsepower and about 350 mm of torque. A lot of you might be wondering why the gains are so less. The primary factor for the gains being so less is basically the intake air temperatures on these engines are so high that the issue basically it starts dropping the power in order to protect the engine. We've ordered a DOT8 intercooler for the car and a racing line intake and we hope once we install those parts and again remeasure the car on the dyno, the car should definitely make a lot more power than what it did today. That brings us to the end of part 1 of tuning these EA888 Gen 3B engines. We will try to post a part 2 video very soon once we have installed the intercooler and the intake and update you guys on what we could achieve with the required hardware mods. We hope you guys enjoyed watching this video as much as we enjoyed shooting it. For more such car content, kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel and do leave your valuable feedback on how we can improve our content in the comment section. And if you guys want to get your cars tuned by us, drop us a text on Instagram or give us a call so that we can get you started. Thank you for watching.